but the one man who outdoes them all. Blager Casey made some extraordinary predictions beyond what we could imagine. He would read the body as though he were an x-ray machine. Edgar Casey was clearly the most gifted psychic of, of the 20th century. From ancient cultures to the modern day, the mysteries of the future have been sought by many and seen by a select few. Prophecy has a rich and controversial history, but who is its most enduring figure? Without a doubt, the most famous is Nostradamus. Known as the prophet of doom for his dark visions of the future, Nostradamus used astrology and magic to look across space and time. And even in his day, he was considered one of Europe's most important visionaries. Nostradamus was a very famous person in his own time, even before he started writing the things that made him famous. He was the court physician and astrologer to the Queen of France. A physician, an astrologer, but also a seer, Nostradamus was a Renaissance man in more ways than one. But more than 400 years after his death, he is remembered mostly for his book, Les Prophecies. A collection of 1,000 visionary poems he wrote between 1555 and 1558. He planned 10 volumes, 1,000 predictions, of which only 942 survive. And they basically look at the you know, profound flows and inclinations of the future. They're not written in stone. There are hundreds of prophecies that indicate alternative futures. Nostradamus's material is clearly clothed in symbology and arcane references and open to different interpretations. But many of them proved eerily accurate, especially those that were fulfilled in Nostradamus's lifetime. His most famous one predicted the death of the King of France in a jousting tournament four years before it happened. In 1559, Henry II confronted the young Count Montgomery in a jousting tournament. The young lion, he will surmount the old one on the field of combat in single battle told. Both men carried shields emblazoned with lions. The younger lion, Count Montgomery, did not lower his jousting stick soon enough, which pierced through the golden visor of the king. He will pierce his eyes through a cage all golden. Count Montgomery, his jousting stick split into large splinters, one wounding the king in the throat, another just behind the eye, blinding him and going into his brain. The final line gives us the denouement, the epilogue to all of this. Two wounds become one, then dying in cruel death's cold. The king lingered for 10 agonizing days, and he finally died from peritonitis of the brain. It's believed that Nostradamus also predicted the French Revolution. From the enslaved people, songs, chants, and demands. In the future, by such headless idiots, these will be taken as divine utterances. The rise and fall of the Emperor Napoleon from the simple soldier, he will aspire to empire. From a short robe, he will aspire to the long. And Hitler's rise to power. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Easter. When the child of Germany observes nothing. He also had ominous visions of the new millennium. The year the great seventh number is accomplished, appearing at the time of the games of slaughter. Not far from the age of the great millennium, when the dead will come out of their graves. So far, this dark vision of our times has not come to pass. But Nostradamus continues to reign as one of the world's greatest prophets. Why people get so convinced that Nostradamus knew what he was talking about is that once you set an interpretation on a given quatrain and you think you know the historical event that it refers to, it's really hard to see that there could have been other alternatives that would have worked just as well. Nostradamus remains a controversial prophet, but across the channel in Yorkshire, England, another seer was having visions of the future, and hers were vivid images of what was to come. 
Mother Shipton was a contemporary of Nostradamus. She was born in the late 1400s and died in 1561, just about five years before Nostradamus. In verse, Mother Shipton is said to have given detailed descriptions of a future that was yet to unfold. And now a word in uncouth rhyme of what shall be in future time. Around the world men's thoughts will fly, quick as the twinkling of an eye. Beneath the water men shall walk, shall ride, shall sleep, shall even talk. For in these wondrous far-off days, the women shall adopt a craze to dress like men and trousers wear, and cut off their locks of hair. It is said she also predicted the Second World War and the end of the world as we know it. In 1926, build houses light with straw and sticks, for then shall mighty wars be planned, and fire and sword shall sweep the land. For those who live the century through, in fear and trembling this shall do, for storms shall rage and oceans roar when Gabriel stands on sea and shore, and as he blows his wondrous horn, old worlds shall die and new be born. Was she predicting the future? or simply imagining it. Prophets, if they were archers, what they would do is shoot an arrow into the wall and have somebody paint a target around it. They let out this vague kind of statement that could be read multiple ways, and they rely on their hearers to put the interpretation into it that fits best for them. But there is still another prophet whose chilling prediction continues to echo across the centuries and resounds all the more ominously today. St. Malachi's prophecy of the popes. St. Malachi was a bishop who lived in 12th century Ireland. On a visit to Rome in 1139, he was struck by a vision. Before him appeared a series of Latin phrases identifying the 111 popes who would rule the Catholic Church until the end of time. He uttered 111 Latin mottos, which are supposed to represent the nature, the name, or destiny, or the coat of arms of every pope until Judgment Day. Many of these phrases are considered too precise to be mere coincidences. John XXIII, the 107th Pope in the prophecy, is referred to as Pastor et Nautum, Pastor and Sailor. Before becoming Pope in 1958, he was the Patriarch of Venice, a marine city. Paul VI is flos florum, flower among flowers. His coat of arms, a lily, among lilies. John Paul II, who is called De Labora Solis. In he is the only pontiff on the list that was born on an eclipse and later entombed during an eclipse. And the 111th and final pope in the prophecy? De Gloria Olive, from the glory of the olive. That's the current Benedict XVI. At the end of the list, Malachi is said to have uttered a final and ominous phrase. This one, unnumbered. During the final persecution, the seat of the Holy Roman Church will be occupied by Peter the Roman, who will feed the sheep in many tribulations, after which the seven-hilled city will be destroyed and the terrible judge will judge his people. The end. Is Malachi describing the end of the Catholic Church or the end of the world as we know it? Is Peter the Roman the last pope after the current Pope Benedict XVI? Some experts believe that since the motto is unnumbered, they are actually one and the same. St. Malachi, Nostradamus, and Shipton, they all predicted events that have since become history. But who are today's foretellers and what can they tell us about our fate? 815. 22, 29. Robert Zoller is a medieval astrologer, a modern day Nostradamus. For 30 years, he's been looking to the stars to decipher the future. And he's made some predictions of astounding accuracy. America will have a new president, and he will be in the stamp of Bush, a younger, more inexperienced version from the same house. There is an increasing threat to the U.S. citizens, and this is particularly so on the eastern seaboard. If the U.S. does not cease acting incompetently, it will invite the depredations of adventurers such as Osama bin Laden and Saddam. The greatest period of danger is in September 2001. 
Coincidence, or do the stars actually predict the future? Number is actually the key to astrology. The sequence of integers between one and nine, and later the addition of zero, was seen by some of the ancients as being the basic principles of whereby being became articulated into something. Astrology rests upon this kind of thinking. The signs themselves come down to number. Why it seems to work, no one knows. But many ancient civilizations also believe the stars and nature held the answers to many of life's mysteries. The Mayans and the Hopis, as virtually all indigenous people throughout the world, were very connected to the sky. The Mayans in particular were very sophisticated in noticing the rhythms of the heavens and building elaborate calendars with great accuracy. The Mayan calendar, which was designed in order to calculate the seasons, was also a prophetic tool. The calendar ends abruptly on December 21st, 2012, and Mayan prophecy describes dark events surrounding that time. The face of the sun will be extinguished because of the great tempest. In a similar way, another Native American culture, the Hopis, have a prophecy that there would be times of great destruction, a day of great purification. These are the signs that great destruction is here. The world shall rock to and fro. The white man will battle people in other lands, those who possess the first light of wisdom. The fourth world shall end soon, and the fifth world will begin. The Hopi Indians, in their final warnings, are saying the world has been destroyed and reborn at least four times. Many native traditions say four times, and we're entering the fifth time. But according to some, these common themes in prophecy are nothing more than patterns of history. All prophets are predicting similar sorts of things. They're essentially talking about how history sort of repeats itself and you'll get the same sorts of things uh, in, in cycles. Perhaps, but there is one man whose prophetic and predictive talents continue to baffle even the most hard-nosed skeptics. With his eighth grade education, he uncovered secrets of our past that no historians could have known. He predicted wars, diagnosed and cured illnesses, and saw cataclysmic changes to our planet that only scientists could have described. And he did it all in his sleep. For 43 years of his life, a man named Edgar Cayce had the amazing ability to put himself in a trance and provide individuals with detailed information about virtually anything they asked about the present, the past, or the future. Edgar Casey is probably the most profoundly important clairvoyant of all time. He was clearly the most gifted psychic of, of the 20th century. He predicted the Second World War, the deaths of presidents, the future of medicine, and diagnosed illnesses in his sleep. His psychic readings, 14,306 of them, are all archived and cataloged at the Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia Beach, Virginia. They remain the most massive collection of psychic material collected from a single source. Edgar Casey didn't give 10, 20, 500 readings in his career. He gave 14,000. Think of a Las Vegas stage performer having to come up with a different routine twice a day, every day for 45 years. It's just not possible. Edgar Casey gave readings about many, many different subjects. Nostradamus wasn't quite as eclectic. But like Nostradamus, Casey was very sought after in his lifetime. And like his French counterpart, he also remained humble about his ability. Both of them were men who were deeply committed to a life of compassion and service to others. Both were very interested in health and healing. Nostradamus was a physician. Edgar Cayce was an intuitive diagnostic physician of sorts. Edgar Cayce and Nostradamus both started as healers, but later became more famous as prophets. Edgar Cayce's amazing destiny takes root in 1877 near Hopkinsville, a small town of tobacco farmers in rural Kentucky. Edgar Cayce's family was typical of middle-class American rural people at the turn of the 20th century. They made their living primarily from the production of dark tobacco, wheat and corn and livestock. They were 
church-going people on Sunday, a straightforward, dignified people, uh, the men of whom were certainly given to the heavy use of tobacco and occasional strong drink. Casey was a seriously odd child. He, he was not the kind of child you would wish on any two parents. As a child, he was surprised to discover that other children didn't have the same sort of experiences that he had. As a boy, Edgar often had visions as he sat in the woods reading his Bible. After his grandfather drowned on the farm pond, young Casey reported seeing him regularly around the farm. Little Edgar is also said to have had the uncanny ability to memorize entire books by sleeping on them. Had he been born in different circumstances, not a, uh, a little rural community, Edgar could very easily have been you know, sold as a circus act. He was completely surrounded by people who loved him, people who protected him. His most amazing talent, which earned him the name Sleeping Prophet, would surface years later when Casey was in his early 20s. While working as an insurance salesman, he developed a severe case of laryngitis. Unable to speak, Casey took a job as a photographer. In the dark room, he wouldn't be required to talk much, but as his condition persisted, he finally decided to seek help. At that time, Edgar had had some uh, friendship association with Dr. Al Lane, a homeopathic physician. And Dr. Lane suggested to young Edgar, why not self-impose hypnosis? What happened next would set Casey's destiny in motion. It was on the 30th of March, 1901, in a two-story brick house on West 7th Street in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, that Edgar Casey lay upon a couch in a contemplative and meditative situation and self-imposed hypnosis. And then, before his parents and maybe a few others in the room, astounded everyone by describing what was wrong with his throat and prescribing treatment for it. The first reading, March 30th, 1901. In his sleep, Casey had spoken in a clear voice and described in detail his ailment and the cure. Soon doctors and patients were coming from far and wide to be diagnosed and cured by the man with the X-ray eyes. One of the amazing things about Edgar Casey's health readings is the piercing nature of his vision into an individual's body. He would read the body as though he were an x-ray machine. And uh, the terminology that he used was quite medical. It's quite amazing. In 1905, Casey told surgeons how to fix the badly broken leg of a local man, George Dalton, by inserting a nail into the brake. The doctors had said Dalton would never walk again. He did. To our knowledge, that was the first time in medical history of the use of a nail. And in the summer of 1911, when doctors told Casey his own wife Gertrude would surely die of a severe case of tuberculosis, she followed his treatment and quickly recovered. Casey's fame as a healer grew fast. In the New York Times, doctors raved about Casey. His psychologic terms would do credit to any professor of nervous anatomy. While in his normal state, he is an illiterate man, especially along the lines of medicine, surgery, or pharmacy, of which he knows nothing. Casey's predictions were amazing in their detail, but his process was simple enough. It wasn't anything mysterious. He would simply lie down on a couch. He would, if he had a tie, a collar on, he'd loosen his collar, loosen his shoelaces, and just cross his hands over his stomach and just relax. There was a window, maybe 30 seconds, maybe 60 seconds, when his eyes began to flutter. And it was at that moment that you could put a question to Edgar Casey. All he had to know was the name of the person the reading was for and where he was at the time of the reading. Could be in California or Kalamazoo, it didn't matter. Oddly, whether he gave a diagnosis, prescribed a cure, or predicted the future, Casey forgot it all as soon as his eyes opened. He didn't remember anything. He didn't remember anything that uh, he said at the reading. And soon, some clients caught on. People would slip in a question about who's going to win a horse race, or what's going to happen in the stock market, and he would answer them much to their profit. As clients got rich on his predictions, Casey suffered from unexplainable migraine headaches where there were selfish purposes involved, 
it was as if the radar screen got fuzzy. He couldn't tune in as clearly or as accurately. It made him ill or made him upset stomach. He just said, I'm through. I'm not doing this anymore. In 1912, with his young wife Gertrude and his son Hugh Lynn in tow, a disillusioned Casey left Hopkinsville and the predictions behind him and moved to Selma, Alabama, where he went back to work as a photographer. He continued that work until my brother dropped a match in a partially filled can of flashlight powder and it burned his face terribly. And all the doctors said, well, he'll never see again. And my brother asked my father for a reading. Two weeks later, after following his father's recommendations, Hugh Lynn's eye was as good as new. Dad realized that he could help people again and that he thought that maybe that's what he ought to do. But he made it a rule that mother would be the one who asked the questions. So nothing could happen like happened in Africansville. But Casey was about to discover new, amazing abilities. And his spine-chilling visions were about to turn him into the greatest prophet of the 20th century. It's the 1920s. Europe is still reeling from the First World War. But across the Atlantic, America is enjoying its ascendance to global superpower. It's a time of frivolity and fun, and a time of rapid change. Big corporations were forming, technology was on the rise, and we were changing from an earlier, simpler people to a much more complicated society. Edgar Cayce represents, as do great actors or poets, an individual who speaks out of the collective need of his time and place and culture. Clients came to Cayce to inquire about everything under the sun. Oil prospectors came asking about the location of oil wells. Some of the most remarkable readings before 1923 are oil readings, geophysical readings. Edgar Cayce gives almost a foot-by-foot -foot breakdown of the geophysical conditions for a particular site. And invariably, he was right. He was dead on. Great minds also met with the sleeping prophet. Thomas Edison received readings uh, on the nature of electricity. Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, who was suffering from a heart condition. We know that George Gershwin received readings. We know that Nelson Rockefeller received readings. Edgar Cayce was extraordinarily eclectic in his psychic work, but his predictions on world affairs with dates and vivid descriptions of events to come are a testament to his prophetic powers. Some of the world affairs readings are absolutely scary. It was like he was reading the headlines four years in advance, consistently. He's under trance in 1925, asked by a client how the future of business will be, and he says, better pull your stocks out. In the adverse forces that will come then in 1929, care should be taken, lest this be taken from the entity. Casey foresaw the onset of the Depression four years before it happened. And in 1931, he accurately predicted an end to the hard times that continued to plague the country. In the spring of 33 will be the real definite improvements. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, of course, that's the New Deal, when we did slowly start to get out of the uh, Depression. Casey also foresaw the next world war long before anyone could have predicted it. In 1935, Edgar Casey was giving a reading to a 29-year-old freight agent, and the individual wanted to know about affairs of an international nature. Casey predicted that there would be an alliance between the Austrians, the Germans, and the Japanese. He says in the reading, and unless there is interference from the divine, the whole world will be set on fire. In 1935, no one had any idea that any of this was about to happen. With the League of Nations still in force, another war seemed implausible, and yet. Baker Casey seems to have had a psychic sensitivity to the coming of World War II. 
There were certainly things in the news that were the clouds of this coming war, but he targeted the time in which it might begin to occur and even its end, and many of the dynamics that went on during those war years. Casey also foresaw social upheavals that would emerge long after his death in 1945. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Edgar Casey's accuracy with predictions is also uh, suggested by his statements about how mob rule could potentially happen in the United States, particularly if there weren't some social changes. Ye ought to have a division in thy own land, before ye have the second of the presidents that next will not live through his office. A mob rule. In April 1945, Roosevelt died in office. Kennedy's assassination would follow in November 1963, as the civil rights movement raged on. That one instance points to how important it is to see that Edgar Casey was also a commentator on social affairs. He said that unless there would be a kind of leveling that would come in society, that there couldn't be one rule for those who were rich and privileged and a different rule for those that were the have-nots, that we were in for tremendous difficult changes in our culture. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. Casey was not a Republican or a Democrat. He wasn't trying to advocate any particular political agenda, but he clearly had a moral sense about something that needed to be achieved if we were to fulfill our destiny as a nation. Whether they dealt with civil strife, war, or medicine, Casey's visions would be lost to us today if it wasn't for Gladys Davis, a young stenographer Casey hired from 1923 on to record every word he uttered while in trance. She was much more than a stenographer. She really completed the work. And it's because of Gladys Davis that we have the readings today. I felt an instant attraction to this man. I just trusted him. One day during a reading, he said a string of words, so I was wondering whether he, whether I should put um, a dash or comma or uh, just how to uh, word this. And uh, over there asleep on the couch, I mean, his eyes closed, he said, put a comma between these. <laughs> After she took the reading, she then typed it up into a copy that she would send to the person who had the reading. In the interest of confidentiality, all the names of the people having readings were removed and numbers were inserted. It made no difference to Casey if his clients were paupers or powerful. He never charged for a reading, relying on donations instead, a decision that weighed heavily on the Casey family. We struggled financially, yes, uh, all the time. My mother was frequently wondering what she was going to buy for groceries next week because if he got two or three readings in a row and he had a little money, he'd buy a load of topsoil for the garden or he'd buy a new fruit tree. I think my father gave these readings because he felt it helped people, and that's what he wanted to do. Casey's greatest ambition was to open a hospital where his patients could receive treatments he prescribed in his medical readings. In 1925, he moved to Virginia Beach, where three years later, the hospital opened. It closed in 1931, in the midst of the Depression. After the hospital had folded and, uh, you know, he'd lost everything, I heard him say that was probably the saddest time of his life. But in good times and in bad, Casey never lost his prophetic touch. In fact, another set of readings had emerged in the 1920s. Prophecy so astounding, that they still echo today and may yet turn history on its head. For 43 years of his life, Edgar Cayce would lie down on a couch, place his hands on his solar plexus, and fall into a self-induced trance. In this state, he traveled through space and time, foretelling wars, diagnosing illnesses, and in some of his most intriguing readings, rewriting history. When we consider Edgar Cayce's predictions, it's also interesting to look at some of the retrocognitive statements he made, looking back into history and making statements about things you wouldn't find in the history book. 
The sleeping Casey seemed to know secrets about our past that only the most high-tech instruments and years of excavating could reveal. Long before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, Casey spoke of an ancient sect of Judaism, the Essenes, which experts believed was made up exclusively of men. Edgar Casey spoke about the Essenes as a community uh, that included men, women, and children. Experts remained dubious, but in the 1950s, years after Casey's death, archaeologists uncovered skeletons of Essene women near the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls. With geology, there are some interesting things as well. Casey suggested that at one time the Nile River flowed in the opposite direction and actually emptied directly into the Atlantic Ocean. Amazingly, in the 1980s, satellite images from the space shuttle revealed unknown river valleys beneath the driest parts of the Sahara. More imaging and on-site exploration revealed that the Nile may indeed have once flowed through the Sahara and into the Atlantic. In Edgar Casey's lifetime, much of what he said about lost civilizations, ancient worlds, was regarded as science fiction. It really wasn't until this century, and literally the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that people have begun to look much harder and realistically at these readings as perhaps, well, maybe these aren't so far-fetched. Probably the most astounding historical readings Casey gave had to do with the lost land of Atlantis. Atlantis, from Edgar Casey's perspective, was the first great Eden on the Earth. It predates the Eden that we uh, know of between the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Eden of Adam and Eve. Edgar Casey saw Atlantis as a massive continent in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And at the time, the individuals that populated the area had a deep understanding of the forces of the universe and could actually harness some of these powers to use devices such as flying machines and crystals and so forth. But according to the readings, the Atlanteans abused their power over nature, and Atlantis disappeared in a cataclysmic disaster some 10,000 years ago. Casey's most specifically timed prophecy said portions of Atlantis would rise again in 1968. It did not. But that year, a strange formation known as the Bimini Road was discovered in the Bahamas. Most geologists think it's beach rock. Beach rock is rock that fractures parallel to the shore. Well, this is parallel to the shore, but the end of it curves around in a kind of a J shape. So that's unusual. No one has gathered any conclusive evidence yet that proves Atlantis lies beneath the Bahamas. But according to Casey, Bimini isn't our only link to the lost continent. Before the final destruction, he said, Atlanteans hid records of their earliest history in other locations. One was in the Yucatan Peninsula. The other was off the right front paw of the Sphinx in Egypt. In the early 1990s, Dr. Robert Schock, a professor of geology at Boston University, conducted geological and seismic surveys on the Sphinx. I was not in the business to support Edgar Casey or any other, I'll call him psychic or prophet. I really knew nothing about him other than his name. Shock and his team were about to make an astounding discovery. We were able to model what was underneath the Great Sphinx. We found under and in front of the left paw of the Sphinx what I believe is a major chamber, maybe up to 25 meters below the surface. Based on its regularity, it looks like it was human carved. And not only is it definitely there, but it seems to have something in it. The way it resonated, the way it ringed, seems to indicate there is something in the chamber. Is it the Atlanteans' Hall of Records Casey spoke of? No one has explored it further. And as intriguing as they are, so far Casey's Atlantis prophecies have come up short. But some suggest that it's Casey's method and not his material that will have the most far-reaching effect on our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. In fact, Casey suggested that with practice, we could all do what he did. I do not believe there is a single individual that does not possess this same ability I have. If they would only be willing to pay the price of detachment from self-interest that it takes to develop those abilities. 
Casey was even able to describe where he got the information that came to him in trance. He said it came from the subconscious mind of the individual he was reading for, and from the Akashic Records, a universal source of knowledge that held all of the pasts, presents, and unfolding futures of mankind. Edgar Casey said, ultimately, when you view it from the highest dimension, there is no time and no space. There is no future and no past. It all is occurring in one fascinating moment of expression, but time is an illusion that has purpose. Casey's readings also suggested that we could impact the future. This idea was shared by another great prophet, Nostradamus. Edgar Casey and Nostradamus both shared the belief that the future was malleable, changeable. It's also true that if you are a prophet, you're also a propagandist. You're trying to persuade, often, the future to change. Why would Casey want the future to change? And what cataclysmic prophecies did he foresee for the new millennium? Edgar Casey made some extraordinary and spectacular earth change predictions, something that would be catastrophic, probably even beyond what we could imagine. From Nostradamus to the Mayas, prophets and prophetic traditions the world over warn of cataclysmic earth changes that will soon be upon us. The ancient Mayans had a sense that there would come a time about in these times in which we're living now that would include tremendous destruction. They speak about the day of the withered fruit and the great tempest, things that sound rather scary. The Hopi speak of trees dying and dramatic changes in the weather that will bring in the great day of purification. Nostradamus speaks of the dead rising from their grave. And Prophet Mother Shipton warns, Storms shall rage and oceans roar. Old worlds shall die and new be born. As for Casey's predictions for the new millennium, they are as dire as all the other prophets before him. Edgar Casey made some extraordinary and spectacular earth change predictions. Probably the biggest one was that the rotational axis of the earth would change. And that's something that would be catastrophic, probably even beyond what we could imagine if that took place literally. If the tilt axis of the earth shifted slightly, the entire mass of the earth would have to reconfigure itself. It would shift ocean basins, it would shift where valleys are, where mountains are. Some of Casey's visions of that future were truly terrifying. He speaks of Japan going into the ocean, inundations for southeastern United States, perhaps in a very slow way, but a permanent kind of inundation. Casey also warned the East Coast would not be spared. Portions of the now East Coast of New York, or New York City itself, will in the main disappear. This will be another generation, though, here, while the southern portions of Carolina, Georgia, these will disappear. This will be much sooner. He also suggests that Europe would change either geologically or climatologically in the twinkling of an eye. Casey actually foresaw these um, as part of the shifting of the poles. And he stated that the Great Lakes would flow down through the Mississippi Valley system and from there flow right into the Gulf. Amazingly, Casey, who knew nothing about plate tectonics, said signs within the Earth would warn us of this coming pole shift. The most dramatic predictions that Edgar Casey made is that there would be the onset of major Earth changes that would escalate in activity from 1958 on through uh, 1998. From that period on, these trends, they would escalate again, then we would know that the pole shift was coming. There will be the upheavals in the Arctic and in the Antarctic that will make for the eruption of volcanoes in the torrid areas. And this will begin in those periods in 58 to 98. Volcanic activity events are increasing. The torrid zone activity has increased, along with general world increase, by something like 500% in the last 50 years. 
Casey also predicted a surge in violent storms and earthquakes in this period. In the last 10 years, hurricane activity in the Atlantic has been at its highest, and an increasing number of earthquakes are being detected around the globe. And in 1999, German researchers measured more than 200 earthquakes in a period of seven months above the Arctic Circle. Arcasi, Shipton, Nostradamus, and the Maya and Hopis before them, reading from the same book of prophecy, People from different cultures seem to have been able to tune into a kind of universal mind, that same level that Nostradamus and Edgar Cayce seem to have been able to tune into also. Is the world as we know it about to end? Some disaster with our skies, with our crops, with our rising oceans, they all can basically agree on that. They may emphasize one aspect more than others, but they all share the fact that we are entering a period of evolutionary crisis. So many different prophetic traditions have talked about times of destruction, times of dire cataclysm, death, devastation. More than anything, those predictions are a wake-up call for all of us as individuals, as a nation, as a world, to look at our relationship to the earth, to nature, and to our relationship with each other. As dire as his earth prophecies appear, Casey believed in living in the present. He also believed, like Nostradamus and other prophets before him, that we have a hand in how the future will unfold. Still, in 1939, just as Casey had predicted, a second world war broke out. And in 1941, as America became entangled in the conflict, more and more people wrote or came to him asking about the fate of loved ones who were fighting abroad. Edgar, in his own readings, was reminded to give not more than two a day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, because each psychic reading was emotionally draining to a system. Well, Edgar Casey could not say no to people, and that ultimately brought his downfall, because by the summer of 1944, he was giving seven and eight readings a day. In September of 1944, fatigued and depleted, Edgar Casey suffered a stroke. He died on January 3, 1945, in Virginia Beach. He's buried in his hometown of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Outside the cemetery, a bronze plaque stands as a testament to his work. But to many, he was more than just a great prophet. Relegating Edgar Casey to the place of someone who simply predicted the future makes Edgar Casey an event. And in my opinion, the material is so helpful, so valuable, that is much more a source of information that to help people in the here and now. He isn't any one thing. That is, you can't stick him in a box and label it mystic. You can't stick him in a box and label him psychic. You can't stick him in a box and label him prophet. At the end of the day, Edgar Cayce's readings are not about whether he was right or wrong about Egyptian or Atlantean history, or whether there even was that kind of history. I think at the end of the day, what matters is that he helps us to better understand who we are and why we're here. Today, the Casey materials continue to provide insights into most every subject under the sun. Whatever he did and however he did it, Casey, like all the great seers before him, left behind a vision of what our future could be. Whether that future unfolds remains to be seen.